Good morning, happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you to our online service this morning here on Facebook. We're so happy for you to be here. Uh, we are welcoming you from your pastor and your first lady. Uh, we thank you so much for your presence this morning and we're going to get into uh, a couple of announcements now and we thank you so much for tuning in and we pray that God blesses you throughout this service. Good morning and happy Sabbath. So happy to be with you this day in May the 30th. Uh, it seems like we just started this month, um, but it has gone by super fast and God has definitely been with us, uh, been protecting us, been providing for us, and we ought to just give his name some glory because he is faithful um, beyond what the circumstances and situations dictate. God is faithful. This morning, I want to get right into our message. We are continuing on in our series. Uh, we will uh, begin part four today. God has definitely been taking us on a journey uh, in the life of David. In this cover up series, we today are going to uh, look at this thing um, from the, 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 I guess the main antagonist uh, of this whole situation with David, the main antagonist in our whole uh, existence, in our lives, um, is the sin that so easily besets us, as scripture dictates. We are going to look at this thing and see uh, how sin absolutely, uh, and this word I'm going to use throughout the duration of this message, how sin warps us into believing and seeing things that are not the reality of the situation. Uh, and we're going to look at David's situation um, and David's experiences to see how sin so changed and marred, warped his mind into believing um, things that are not and were not the reality and how it actually uh, plays a part in our lives today. This is not just uh, what David went through, but it is absolutely what we go through day in, day out, month to month. Whenever we deal with sin, whenever we deal with uh, us dealing with the sin, uh, it is a, a, a situation where we are outmatched, outgunned if we try to deal with it ourselves. But sin uh, is an ugly thing. And this is what sin did to David. This is what sin does to us. And we will identify the problem, uh, but later on in our series, we will absolutely identify the resolution. Amen. Because uh, that that's the that's the the main goal that we want to establish here, and that I'm striving to establish here how bad sin is um, on one side of the spectrum, but how good God is on the other side. So we are absolutely looking um, at how bad sin has been, can be, is being for us, um, and how good God is in that he sees beyond our faults and provides our needs. We are going to look at 2 Samuel again, and we are going to recount some of the things that we went over last week um, to preface what this this week's message is going to entail. Um, I'm reading from 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 18 through verse 27. Verse 18 through verse 27. 18 through verse 27. I know it's a lot of scripture, but uh, God be glorified. We are reading uh, for the edification of God's people. The word of God says this, then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you approach so near the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, 
your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants and some of the king's servants are dead and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Verse 25, then David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab, do not let this thing displease you for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him. Verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she came and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. If you permit me for a little time this morning, I'd like to speak under the topic entitled The Cover Up, The Spoils of Sin. The Spoils of Sin. We're praying, Dear Heavenly Father, speak your thoughts, fill our hearts, blow our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've gone through the narrative of David. We've seen um, where David uh, has obviously going off the deep end. Um, he has committed adultery uh, and now he has added murder to his uh, 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 list of sins that he has uh, com uh, 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 committed. He has um, uh, wrote people in to, to, to contribute and to uh, uh, pat him on the back on this thing and, and go right along with him uh, of this cover up. And at some juncture, here towards the end of chapter 11, David in his mind has reasoned after he has gotten news that Uriah has passed or that he was slain in battle, he has concocted in his mind that I have, have done it. I've, I've done away with this sin. I've, I've successfully covered it up. Um, the kingdom doesn't know about this thing. I, I, I've kept my seeming integrity intact. The, the, the people that I oversee, the people that I rule over uh, are none the wiser. I, I, I've, I've come out on top of this thing. And for sin and the sin that we, we, we deal with on a daily basis, this thing will so get our thinking off the track that God has had us on and God is taking us to that we will actually begin to believe that we have uh, uh, have successfully pushed uh, our, 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 our sin to a place where no one can uncover it and we've successfully covered this thing to a point where nobody will ever find out about it and it's very funny because if we look at David's life it's very contrary to how David in his past has been overcoming and been able to, to succeed in, his, uh, uh, in his, his life before he was king. If we look at his story, if we look at his narrative, coming from a shepherd boy to a soldier to being in the king's service and then becoming king, God absolutely orchestrated God, foresaw God, <coughs> was absolutely there to see every different angle, see every different thing, to be able to guide David and navigate through these things that would arise in his life so that he could become and embody the anointing that Samuel, uh, directed by God, was had put on, on David to be the king of God's people. Now you see where God had brought David from and has brought David from, and now you see this, this picture where David is thinking 
And this is a stupid mindset for David to have, and this is a stupid mindset for us to have, thinking that he was able to, to hide and cover up this sin, not only before the people, but also before the God that anointed him to be king. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the spoils of sin this morning. In other words, I want to say, and I want to say very distinctly, David's mind has been so marred and so warped by the sin that he's found himself in and he's been tempted to uh, commit that he believes that God even, not even God knows about this thing. That he's covered this thing up so successfully that he has, uh, 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 that he's orchestrated this thing in such a way that not even the God of the universe can uncover this thing. Yeah, look at this thing, the spoils of sin. There are three things that I want to bring out from this particular part of the narrative that David does and we do also, unbeknownst to us or beknownst to us, or that we try to, to suppress, that we try to, to distance ourselves from so that we do not feel the guilt that comes along with our sin. Now look at this thing. The thing are the things that, that sin does and, and, and the spoils of sin in our minds. And I, 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 I deemed it this way for a reason because sin has warped our mind to a point where when we are on the other side of this thing or we think that we have distanced ourselves be, between us and our sins, look at this, not with God's help, but with ourself uh, self-help, our self-sufficiency, our self-confidence in dealing with our mess ourselves when we have distanced ourselves from our sin in our minds we have reaped the benefits of our work. In other words we, we, we are now enjoying the spoils of our work to, to, to cleanse ourselves from our sins. In other words the spoils of sin. Look at the word of God. Look at the word of God. The Bible says that in verse 25, when David received message from Joab that Uriah had passed, that he sent word back to, to Joab, oh, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, it, it, it hey, hey, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, in other words. Uh, it happens. It, it, it's, it, it goes along with war and battle. Some are going to be lost. Some are, are, are going to, to, to be casualties of war. And Uriah is just chalked up to being a casualty of war. And in David's mind, look at this thing. He has successfully been a, 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 a judge, a jury, and he has uh, extricated himself from this situation, so he is enjoying the, the fruits of his labor, so he no longer has to deal with the elephant in the room, which is Uriah, and he, in his mind, has resolved the situation. And this is the first thing that sin will, will, will have you doing and have you thinking. Sin will warp your mind to feel as though the situation has been resolved. Look at David. David is so uh, is so happy at Uriah's demise, and I want to I want to I want to clarify this thing and and quantify how crazy this thing is. Uriah is one of David's most uh, most integrous, most uh, valiant, most loyal men. And the Bible says that when he is slain in battle due to David's words and David's letter to Joab, David says, oh, you win some, you lose some. Oh, it, it, it goes along with battle. Oh, don't, don't worry about it, Joab. Uriah, mm, it, 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 it happens. In other words, he is saying uh, not only by his actions, but by his words, that Uriah was easily replaceable. And I have to let you know this thing, that it's, 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 scholars suggest 
that these mighty men, these valiant men under David's service and, and, and uh, Joab's leadership as general, as, uh, 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 as leader of the armies, these men, it would be, uh, they suggest that these men uh, would, it, and I'm, I'm not even talking about the most valiant men, the, the, the one man in the army of Israel back in the ancient days would be compared to 10 men in the armies that we see now. One man would be compared to 10 men in the armies that we see now. So you can, you can think if, if this was a valiant and, and loyal and, and a very integral man in, in David's army, he must have been worth 50 men. Uh, of today's army. I said all that to say this, in light of David's sin, he was expendable so that David can get the false sense that this situation was no longer a problem. It was resolved. So David, in David's mind, I no longer have to deal with the, the, the law as it comes to Uriah being able to enact this 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 adulterer adulterous law in found in Leviticus 20 and verse 10 if he, he if he were to do that he would be justified but since he's dead it, it, it doesn't matter anymore this situation is resolved in in our minds when uh, the problem itself has been, uh, or, or what the root of our problem, the root of our guilt, if it has been uh, um, cut down or it has been taken away in our mind, the situation is resolved. And we no longer have to deal with the problems that arise because of this situation or this individual being in close proximity to us because I, I, I got news for you, and you know this to be true, you feel more guilt when you have to see that person or, or see that be around that situation or, or be in the mix on a daily basis. You feel more guilt. And if that person, if that situation has been taken away in your mind, oh, problem solved. I no longer have to deal with this situation. Sin will warp your minds to believe that the situation, the problem has been resolved. The sin is no more. And that's a problem. The second thing, the second thing that we're going to look at, the second thing that we're going to look at um, in verse 26 uh, and, and 27, the Bible says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Look at this. Ha! Ah, look at this. The second thing that we want to look at that is in the same vein of this spoils of sin where we get this self-gratification or this false sense of self-gratification where we have uh, gotten over this lump of sin and we've gone around the boundaries and we have no longer had to deal with this thing. Sin will warp your mind to believe the matter has been covered up. Because look at this. David never tried to get Bathsheba to abort the child, or he never tried to harm Bathsheba as a result of the child being, uh, 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 her bearing the child. He was trying to cover it up. But because he was successful in taking out Uriah, now it was permissible by the apparent laws of the land, people looking in on the situation, seeing that since Uriah is dead, legally Bathsheba, look at this, can marry another man. 
and be with another man. So the Bible dictates in verse 26 that Bathsheba has a herd that Uriah is dead and now she takes the time to mourn and uh, biblical scholars believe it was between seven and 30 days that someone would take to mourn. So believing that, uh, that Bathsheba actually cared for her husband in some semblance of the form, look, it's believed that she took the 30 day period and was to herself and she mourned and then after she was done with her mourning period, the Bible says that David sent for her and moved her into the palace and she became his wife. So look at this thing. David has sinned in committing adultery and he sinned in committing murder. Sin, this sin of murder has convinced and convicted David to the point where he believes that this whole situation is covered up now. Uriah was the main denominator that would have, uh, was the co common denominator that would have thrown a monkey wrench in David's plan. And since Uriah is out of the picture, this, that situation was resolved as Uriah being the problem. But now, since Uriah is out of the picture, now Bathsheba is free to do as she pleases and she can marry whom she desires or she can be taken as a wife by another man. And the king, David, takes her as wife, moves her into the palace, and the kingdom itself at large is none the wiser because, look at this, Uriah's, her husband is dead. Uriah was none the wiser to the injustices done to him. And the kingdom at a point, at a level, was none the wiser to the injustices done by their king, their ruler, to this man and him taking his wife for himself and lying with her and then killing him to take her as his wife. Kingdom was none the wise. And sin in our lives will have us believing that um, we've successfully masked this thing. Um, and we've successfully uh, uh, covered it up to the point where nobody is going to be able to 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 uncover this thing uh, and nobody is going to be able to call us out on this thing because nobody's going to know about this thing and this is what happens this is what happens as David does in trying to cover it up from the kingdom and from all of his princes and all of uh, the fellow rulers in his court as he tries to cover this thing up from them he also believes, he comes to a level, sin has warped his mind to this point, where he has successfully covered it up from God as well. And that's what we do. Um, and th I, I think this is so silly because um, though we feel like we've resolved the issue, though we feel like we've covered up the issue, our mess can never be covered up from God. And that's why I preface this whole message by going back to David's shepherd years and when he was in service of the army and then in service of the king and then he was king, made king in God's will and God orchestrating that thing. If God saw all the dangers that he would face and brought him out on the other side of that thing, how can God not see the mess that he causes? And I got news for you. God, <laughs> don't psych yourself out. God absolutely knows what we have done in our closets of sin and what we've pushed under the bed in our, and, and, and what we've shoved under the rug and all the things that we've tried to cover up, all the things that we think are resolved, all the things that, that we think nobody and God will not find out about it, I got news for you. My Bible tells me that there will be a day where every valley will be exalted. And it's not just talking about the earth and the physicalities of the earth, but I'm talking about every valley in our lives will be exalted. And everything the Bible says that's done in the dark will be coming to the light and everybody will see. And that's why I'm telling you right now. And that's why this story is in the Bible because it's not even smart. It's not even intellectual for us to think 
that we can cover our mess up now and nobody will ever find out about it. And God himself won't even be able to look at our stuff and put a magnifying glass on our life and see us for who we really are. How dare we think? How, how can we come to, to a level of, of self-sufficiency and a level of, of confidence that we can cover up something from God? God sees all. He knows all. And that's why the story is in the Bible. Again, I'm telling you, because it wants and it serves for us to see that God sees and knows all. And there's no reason for us to even feel as though we can cover it up from God. Like Cain and Abel, Cain tries to hide the fact that he's killed Abel. And God sees and talks to him from heaven. Your brother's blood is literally crying out to me from the ground. And we try to cover up these different things in our lives as though God doesn't know. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And when the Bible says that everything will be brought to light and there shall be nothing that is done in darkness that shall not be brought to light. I got news for you. It's time for us to reach a, a level of spiritual maturity that we stop trying to hide our mess from God. Just like your child tried to hide their mess from you, you, know, you go and run an errand and, and you're out uh, uh, and they either break something at home or they got a bad report from school or something like that. When they try to hide something from you, you came in the house and you immediately see in their faces that something is not right. You immediately see the guilt uh, riddled in their whole body because you know your child. And just like you know your child because it's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh and you see yourself in your child, just like you know your child in, that, in those ways, God knows us better than that because God created us. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what makes us work. He knows how to, uh, how to uh, orchestrate things in our lives. He knows us and he knows when we're trying to cover up something. As a matter of fact, he sees when we're trying to cover up something. And it makes me uh, think about Jonah, how crazy Jonah was uh, as he, the Bible says, he was trying to hide from the presence of the Lord. How do we try to hide our mess from the presence of the Lord? How does that happen? How, because look at this, and I'm giving you an answer right now. Sin warped our mind into believing that we can hide our mess from the presence of the Lord. The spoils of sin. So number one, sin will warp your mind to feel as though the situation is resolved. Number two, sin will warp your mind to believe that the matter has been covered up. And nobody is going to find out about it. Because Uriah died, now I can freely marry and freely be with Bathsheba. She's going through her, 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 her customary days uh, of the land, uh, her, her days of mourning. And now the situation is smoothed over. Nobody is none the wiser. The only one uh, that knows about it is Joab. Number three. Um, and this is, um, I guess, the, the culmination of how sin warps our minds. Um, number three, number three. Sin will warp your mind to be unrepentant. Sin will warp your mind to be unrepentant. We know that David commits adultery, David commits murder. But the underlying current here is that David's heart, David's mind, is not repentant. How do I know this? Because from the time that he, he, he lies with Bathsheba 
to the time um, here in verse 27 when the Bible says he moves her into his house and she became his wife and bore him a son even to the time when Nathan comes and confronts him there is no time in between where David is shown as a repentant man. I want you to see this. David, some nine months have passed where David has committed this sin of adultery and murder and has taken another man's wife unto himself and he has not even uttered a God I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I, I, I want to repent of this sin. And as a matter of fact, during these nine months, little seeds of whispers are starting to get out. Did you hear what happened to Uriah? Do you see that, that Bathsheba is now in the king's palace? Something's not sitting right. And it's starting to spread around the king's palace. And it's starting to spread throughout the kingdom. And people are beginning to whisper that the king's integrity is in question. Wait a minute. This is our ruler and this is what he's doing. This is what's going on in the king's house. Yet David is still unrepentant. Sin has so warped him to the point where he's think, he thinks the matter has been resolved and he thinks that it's been covered up in such a way that nobody can find out that he's not even sorry for the mess that he's caused. Uh, we're the same way. Um, when, 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 when we believe that the situation has been resolved and our mess has been covered up, sin will warp us to the point where we believe that, oh, we're not at fault. We, be, we bear no blame in the situation. But God says in his word, be sure your sins will find you out. That's why God's word says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever get to a point. Don't ever get to a place where you think you've covered up. You think you've resolved. You think that, uh, 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 that, that all this stuff has been taken care of. That it warps you to a point where you're unrepentant and you don't come to God for sin. Because I, I got news for you, and I've said this before. The only sin that God cannot and will not deal with is sin that is unconfessed. And if we don't confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 1 9 uh, says this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we have convinced ourselves and let sin warp our minds to the point where we are unrepentant, then we are bearing the sin that we've committed for ourselves. And David, in so many ways, in trying to orchestrate um, a, a, a solution for his problem and trying to rectify his problem without seeking God and without coming clean, uh, with the mess that he's caused and the mess that he, he's, he started in his kingdom, he has believed that he has sufficiently self-contained uh, uh, this thing to the point where nobody will find out about this thing. To the point, the very last verse of this, this chapter, verse 27, last part. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I want you to understand this. When we try to get and dig ourselves out of the hole of sin that we're in by committing more sin and trying to cover up the sin that we just committed, when we try to get ourselves out of a hole and we, 
we seemingly see that it's resolved or it's covered up or it's combed over and then we become unrepentant just like it did in David's life it will displease the Lord because when your heart is not repentant when your spirit has not been constantly put on the altar of God praying for forgiveness of your sin then God can do nothing for you and that's a dangerous place for us to be in stop enjoying the spoils of sin and start dealing with the sin in the only way we know how and that is to go to God that's the only way we can deal with this sin problem that we have we can't go to our doctor to deal with it we can't get a written a prescription to deal with it we can't go to our friends to deal with it we can't go to our husbands or wives to deal with it we can't go to our siblings to deal with it the only place we can go to deal with our sin is God that's the only place and some of us have gotten to a point where we think that we can deal with our sin ourselves. That's the devil lying to you right now in the name of Jesus, the devil is lying to you because he is trying to convince you that you can deal with your mess and that you can rectify your situation so that your faith is in yourself and not in God. And David's faith was in himself. David's trust was in himself. To the point where he got to verse 27 and the Bible says the things that David did displeased the Lord. Now if David had to come to God in a repentant spirit after he committed adultery, after that first initial sin, instead of trying to cover it up. If David had to come clean to God, then the ramifications of his actions, perhaps God may may have... Uh, had mercy on him and Bathsheba's first, first child, and maybe the child wouldn't have been taken away. But because David was unrepentant, he had an unrepentant heart, unrepentant spirit. God says, I have to, I have, because I love him so much, and this is how merciful God is. God, thank you so much. Imagine if this situation, uh, um, had combed over and God would not have taken the first child and God would not have sent Nathan if God would not have uh, uh, come to David and called him out on his sin imagine where the nation would have been led at that point it was already under duress but it would have been led further and further away from God because David would have thought I got away with this sin I can get myself out of my messes. And that would have led a whole nation to ruin. And it will lead us to ruin if we believe that we can get ourselves out of our mess. Stop enjoying the spoils of sin. Give your mess to God. Confess your sins to God. Because God is the only one that can deal with your mess. You can't deal with it. I, as your pastor, cannot deal with it. Your therapist cannot deal with it. But God and God alone is able to deal with your mess and deal with you at the same time. Because God is the only one. And we can't, we don't have this skill. We don't have this level of, of, of righteous indignation. God is the only one who can hate the sin and love the sinner. See, for us, we hate the sinner and we hate the sin. And sometimes we hate the sinner and love the sin. God is the only one. So I'm challenging everybody listening on this stream right now. Whatever your sin is. Whatever you think that you've gotten away with, whatever you think that you've swept under the rug, whatever you think that nobody will ever be able to find out, whatever it is that you're sticking to your gun with, lying about and cheating about, whatever you think it is that nobody will ever be, God knows. God knows. And I, I want you right now, between you and God, you need to go and confess those things. 
get forgiveness of those things because if you don't do it now, the time will be too late at the end of time and you will be there paying for your own sins. Give your sins, your burdens to God. Let him pay for it. He paid it all on Calvary. Don't enjoy the spoils of sin. If you want special prayer, I want you to drop your name in this in this chat right now. I want you to drop your name for your sin, for the sins of your brothers and sisters, those that don't even know to pray for themselves. I want you to drop their names right now and we're going to have a special prayer for them. Drop their names right now. We're going to have a special prayer. Every eye is closed, every head is bowed. Father God, right now, we have learned from David. David got to a point in his life where he thought that he had resolved it, he had covered it up, he, and then ultimately he was unrepentant. It took you sending somebody to call him out. So Father Lord, this is what I desire. This is what I desire. Not only for me, but for all those represented on the stream, all the names in the chat, Father God, right now, send your Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin call our sin out in our lives so that we may come to you and get the forgiveness that only you offer and only you can offer. Father God, we're tired of living in our mess. We're tired of the guilt. We're tired of going through habit after habit and addiction after addiction. We're tired of living like this. And God, we need freedom from our sin. Help us not to ever get to a place where we feel as though we can deal with our sin ourselves. But Father God, help us always to come to you. Help us never to get comfortable. Help us never to receive or get to a level of an unrepentant heart. But by your spirit and by your grace, God, call us out. Your word says, whom you love, you chastise. So Lord, if you gotta beat us down to build us up, do it and God bless all those that are dealing with uh, this this COVID-19 that are dealing with job loss Lord provide for their needs not only physical needs but their spiritual needs and if there's anything in this prayer that I failed to ask Lord you and in your infinite wisdom you and your grace and mercy fail not to grant it for us and God help us to depend on you to take care of our mess and help us not lean to our own understanding. And if you do this for us, Master, we'll be careful to give you all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings on you.